the reason I'm going on and on about the primary productivity in different ecosystems and globally is because the availability of energy turns out to determine a huge amount of things about different ecosystems, all the way up from plants to top predators. Often in ecology, um, scientists think of energy as the currency by which the economy of nature runs. Organisms tend to act in a way that maximizes their energy intake and minimizes their energy expenditure. Um, and the more energy you can get, the more you can reproduce. It's extraordinarily valuable and often just keeping track of energy uh, without worrying about nutrients of any kind can predict what organisms ought to be doing in an ecosystem. So energy is really incredibly important. Um, what happens to energy once it is captured by plants and stored in their tissues as net primary productivity? Well, um, what happens is that it eventually becomes available to consumers of some kind. So for example, a rotting log has a lot of high energy chemical compounds that are available to certain consumers. And this is the, this is the, the organism that basically captured the energy is referred to as the lowest trophic level in a food chain. An organism that feeds on that is obviously a consumer. A uh, puffball, actually the body of a puffball is these fine thread-like structures that infiltrate the rotting log and uh, take it apart at a microscopic level. Uh, but that, this puffball is a consumer. It is on the next trophic level. If millipedes eat puffballs, they are on the next trophic level up. And if salamanders eat millipedes, they are the next trophic level up. These would be primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. If something eats salamanders, that's at a higher trophic level still. So in this food chain, um, you're going up from this lowest trophic level um, up through the consumers to the highest trophic level. There can be different food chains. Uh, so for example, dead maple leaves are fed on by different organisms than the ones that eat live maple leaves. And they in turn feed different organisms so that you get one food chain that starts with decomposers and you get one that starts with these grazers. Um, one thing you may be wondering when you're thinking about uh, decomposers and detritivores like the puffball and the earthworm is what happens when an animal dies. Okay, technically that's considered to be the lowest trophic level is once you have dead matter, it sort of acts like a producer. Uh, as far as a decomposer food chain is concerned. And so the earthworm would be a primary consumer, salamander secondary consumer, and fox would be a tertiary consumer. <clears throat> the food chains that I'm showing you are in fact um, a grotesque oversimplification of reality. Actually, this is what uh, reality starts to look like, is not a food chain, but a food web. Almost all organisms that are out there are eaten by more than one consumer. Almost all organisms that are out there eat more than one food source. And honestly, let's face it, this is grossly oversimplified. Real food webs look something much more like this. Except to be honest, this is oversimplified because it leaves out a tremendous number of species that are found in this offshore ecosystem. So food webs are incredibly complicated. And I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to be talking about different trophic levels, but to be honest, trophic levels are sort of a fiction. There are organisms that only eat plants. Okay, there are organisms that only eat organisms that eat plants. But um, usually organisms that eat herbivores will also eat a carnivore if they get the chance. Often organisms that eat plants will also snack on a little animal protein if they get the opportunity. So um, when we talk about primary consumers, realize that in the real world, most species are not purely primary consumers. They might be like 90% primary consumer, that is 90% of the time they eat plant matter, but 10% they're secondary consumer, that is 10% of the time they eat herbivores. Okay, so what I'd like to do now 
is turn our attention to what happens to energy as it passes up a food chain. Um, there's an incredible amount of energy hitting this planet every day. It's over a million calories per square meter per year. Um, given the fact that, say, your daily allowance for calories is probably one or 2,000 calories, um, that's obviously a tremendous amount of energy, um, enough to keep a very large number of people alive in one square meter, or sorry, a small number of people alive in one square meter of land every year, if we could just capture it. Um, plants are really pretty good at capturing energy, but even they only pick up less than 1% of that energy. Most of the energy that plants pick up is actually lost. So if gross primary productivity is proportional to the width of these two arrows, most of that ends up being lost by keeping the plant alive or just by being wasted. Only 45% of the, the energy captured by plants goes to make plant biomass. Where does most of the rest go? Honestly, most of the rest goes straight to the decomposers. Herbivores, um, animals that eat living plants, get very little of it. Um, this is particularly true in some ecosystems, such as forest ecosystems, where most of the plant biomass is locked up in chemical forms like wood that are really difficult to get at. There are very few organisms on Earth that can extract energy out of wood. In fact, the organisms that can break down wood basically just do it to get it out of the way so they can get the yummy stuff like cellulose. So about three quarters of the net primary produ production in say a woodland habitat goes straight to the decomposers. And only about a, a quarter or 11% of the um, net primary production ends up going to the consumer food web. Consumers in turn waste and use a tremendous amount of that energy. Particularly warm-blooded organisms are extremely wasteful. The way that your body keeps warm is just burning most of the energy that you take in, uh, not to maintain your body, but just kind of cycling mindlessly through the um, leaky membranes of your mitochondria. As a side effect of that waste of energy, you generate heat, and that heat allows your body to function faster. Uh, it allows you to keep your body temperature up so that your enzymatic reactions can go more quickly. And that is a, it's a really interesting innovation that has um, allowed warm-blooded organisms to take over a lot of new ecological niches, but it comes at a tremendous energetic cost. Uh, organisms like this chipmunk burn something like um, 80% of the energy they take in in maintenance, that is keeping themselves alive, and heat production. Uh, believe it or not, but uh, 15 to 20 percent of the energy that a chipmunk takes in just gets pooped out. It's not taken up during the digestive process. And what that means is less than 2 percent of the energy taken in by a chipmunk goes to generate more chipmunk. Now, if you remember that only 11% of net primary productivity even made it to the chipmunk, it should be pretty obvious to you that um, anything that's going to live on chipmunks is going to have pretty slim pickings. Okay, because for every calorie that hits the earth, very little of it is going to build chipmunk biomass. And if you depend on chipmunk biomass to make a living, um, you're going to have to hunt pretty far and wide for food. So all of this loss of energy can be conceptualized in terms of certain efficiencies. Okay, and the first efficiency that we want to consider is consumption efficiency. Most of the biomass that is built up by plants or by consumers of some kind is not consumed. So most of the primary production, for example, ends up going straight into detritus. Um, the consumption efficiency is the percentage of the available biomass that goes up, to, that actually gets ingested by organisms at the next trophic level. And again, in this ecosystem, that's going to be about 10%. And that's generally 
um, as much as that's roughly the order that consumption efficiency usually is. Okay, of the energy that is consumed, oh, sorry. Um, consumption efficiency is very strongly related to the accessibility of biomass. In particular, the most striking example of this is terrestrial plants. Because when you go outside and you look at something like a tree, mostly what you're looking at is wood, and wood is inedible. So even though a tree is a tremendous amount of biomass, and it costs a huge amount of energy, to put that tree trunk together, very, very little of that energy is ever going to be passed on to any other organism, whether it's a decomposer or a consumer. Okay, so that wood that most plant, most terrestrial plants are made heavily of, or sorry, many terrestrial plants anyway are made heavily of, is energetically speaking a dead end. Okay, once you get animal matter, uh, most animal matter is very digestible. There are some kinds of plants or some kind of producers, at least, like algae, that are also tend to be very digestible. And so consumption efficiency for those organisms tends to be pretty high. The second efficiency that you have to consider is assimilation efficiency. Not all of the biomass that organisms take in gets, um, that gets ingested, sorry, not all the, the biomass that consumers ingest gets actually taken up by their tissues. So for example, uh, again, this chipmunk is taking up a lot of energy, but a certain amount um, is just getting excreted again. So there's an inefficiency here that causes this chipmunk to lose energy that was actually going into its body because it never assimilates it. Um, herbivores and detritivores have an assimilation efficiency of maybe 20 to 50 percent. Well, the assimilation efficiency for carnivores is about 80%. Mostly, this is because detritus and plant matter is very nutrient poor. Um, the way, the, maybe the best way of explaining this is to suppose that um, you are making a batch of pancakes. One recipe of pancakes requires a cup of flour, two teaspoons of baking powder, and an egg. Okay. If you have one cup of flour and an entire can of baking powder and a dozen eggs, you can still only make one batch of pancakes because you're limited by the ingredient that is in shortest supply. You're limited by the amount of flour that you've got. Um, what plants have in them is basically very little flour and a lot of eggs. Really what it is is very little nitrogen and a lot of carbon. So organisms that eat plant matter have to chew their way through a lot of extra carbon containing compounds in order to get the little bit of nitrogen that they need to make their own bodies. Because an animal has a much higher percentage of nitrogen in its biomass than a plant does. So for this reason, when an organism eats plant matter, um, much of the energy that it takes in basically into its digestive system, it just lets go. It, it poops it back out again, and it goes into the decomposer food chain because the, um, the plant eater can't really do anything with that energy. It doesn't have enough nitrogen to use that energy to build muscle. In other words, it doesn't have enough flour to use those extra eggs to make pancakes. <clears throat> this is also... Um, a function of the fact that plants are often made out of compounds that are not digestible, and the detritus contains a lot of chemical compounds that are not digestible. I've been telling you a lot about wood. Um, wood is mostly made of lignin, which is basically impossible to break down except for a few organisms, and even they can't get the energy out of it. Cellulose also cannot be broken down by very many organisms, um, and so it is essentially just pass through the digestive system of organisms like me and you. We know cellulose as roughage. It doesn't provide us any calories, it just scours out our bowels and keeps us nice and clean in there. Finally, there's production efficiency. Um, organisms can't use all of the energy they take in to make new biomass. Um, and that's because, as we mentioned earlier, they have to use some of that energy just to keep their cells alive. Just to stay running, um, you use a certain amount of energy every day. 
Uh, also, energy is wasted, like the energy that you use to heat up your body is largely just radiated off. Um, that wasted energy is also not used to build more of you. So we've got consumption efficiency, uh, assimilation efficiency, and production efficiency. Those are all reasons or points at which energy is lost as it moves from one trophic level to another up the food chain. Because of all these losses, you get a pattern called a trophic pyramid. And this is the shape. I mean, you obviously see um, where it got its name from. Basically, the efficiency of energy transfer up a food chain is only going to be somewhere between 10 and 20% efficient at any particular step. So every step you make up, the, up the food chain, you're losing maybe uh, four-fifths, maybe nine-tenths of the energy from the trophic level below. Um, the upshot of that is that when you get high up in the food chain to say tertiary consumers like the salamander, very little of the energy that is captured by primary producers ever makes it up that far up the food chain. This is because energy transfer between one trophic level and another is very inefficient. 